Hi, my name is Dr. Vera Tarman and welcome to today's event, the I'm Sweet Enough, the September Sugar-Free Challenge webinar series. And today, we have a special guest, Gary Tobes, who is the, an, an investigative science and health journalist and bestseller of three books that have challenged the sugar industry and changed the way we see and talk about sugar. Before we start the webinar, Tony, our moderator, will lead with a few housekeeping notes. You're on, Tony. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Tony Vassallo, and I have the pleasure of moderating our time together. Uh, yes, our host, uh, Dr. Vera Tarman, good friend and colleague of mine, is a medical addiction specialist who has worked in the field of addiction, uh, field of sugar and food addiction for over uh, 20 years. Uh, she is the author of this fabulous book, Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction, filled with, um, filled with stories of hope and empowerment. Uh, and our guest today is Gary Tobbs, uh, a world-renowned investigative science and health journalist who has taken the sugar industry by storm. He is a graduate of Harvard and Stanford. He achieved his journalism degree from Columbia. He is the recipient of, number of, health, of a number of health policy awards, including a three-time winner of Science in Society Journalism Award. He has been a frequent contributor to Discover and Science Magazine. He is also a co-founder of the nonprofit Nutritional Science Initiative. He is uh, best known for uh, three books. First of all, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. Uh, the next book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. I always forget about that mirror. And his most recent riveting read, and I'm sure we'll get into it today, The Case Against Sugar. Uh, my copy is, uh, if you take a note here, it's autographed. I had a, the pleasure, actually, Vera and I, I had a chance to meet you in 2016 when you're at Brotman University of Toronto. Uh, and I'll wrap up. He's also appeared in numerous documentaries like That Sugar Film, Fed Up, Fat, and my personal favorite, because it has a Canadian connection, Sugar Coated. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to pass the mic back to Dr. Vera Tarman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, for wonderful introductions. And uh, Gary Tobes, you can see that we are great fans of yours um, and are absolutely thrilled to have you uh, uh, visit us, like thrilled. To, you don't even know how much. So welcome. Would you like to uh, respond? <laughs> well, uh, Tony, Vera, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you for all the kind words. Um, you know, as I, we were saying briefly before we got started, I, I love Toronto and maybe moving there with my family come November 4th so, uh, or November 5th or whenever it happens to be decided. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, let's talk about sugar. Let's, let's do it. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I want to um, uh, take my first question from your book, The Case Against Sugar. Um, uh, so just, just to, for, for our listeners to get a sort of background. Um, your latest book, The Case Against Sugar, um, shows the connection between the rise of the sugar industry um, over the past hundred years um, and ties that to the prevalence of health concerns that we suffer today. And uh, there's three quotes that I want to read just uh, as a backdrop to our conversation. By the 1920s, these are your quotes, uh, by the 1920s, sugar refineries were producing as much sugar in a single day uh, millions of pounds, as would have taken refineries in the 1820s to do in an entire decade. In, the 19, in 1960, fewer than 13% of Americans were obese, and diabetes was diagnosed in 1%. Today, the percentage of obese Americans has almost tripled to like two-thirds of the population or more, and the percentage of Americans with diabetes has increased sevenfold, so that instead of, uh, uh, you know, one in a hundred, it's essentially now almost one in ten, or it's going to be there soon. And the last quote, we now eat in two weeks the amount of sugar our ancestors of 200 years ago ate in one whole year, and hence the illness that has followed. So Gary, can you elaborate? Now this is maybe not a fair question because I'm asking you to squish a huge um, uh, concept into a, you know, a paragraph or less, but can you elaborate how, how eating too much sugar can bring us to getting fatter and sicker? Uh, okay. That's that a, big, is a question. big question. Yeah. So let me, um, let me first shift it and just explain a little bit more the argument I make in this book. So the, the argument, the book's okay. called The Case Against Sugar for a reason, because um, <clears throat> what we've seen worldwide, not just in the United States, is worldwide, you've got the epidemic 
levels of obesity and diabetes that appear uh, whenever a population shifts from whatever its traditional diet was. It doesn't matter what kind of diet they ate, whether it was purely carnivore or almost purely plant-based. And when they shift to a Western diet, you see these dramatic increase in obesity and diabetes, and then all the diseases that associate with obesity and diabetes, which is basically every chronic disease that'll kill us prematurely. Um, conventional wisdom is that as we make that shift, you have more food available, you have less physical activity, people eat more, uh, they get fatter, and then so they get fatter because they eat more and they get diabetic because they're getting heavier. And the argument that I make in the book, and I've made in my other books, is that the process of getting fat or getting obese is a issue. It's not a calorie issue. It's a dysregulation of hormones, and particularly the hormone insulin. And insulin is driven by the carbohydrates we consume. And the problem there, ironically, is, or the primary problem, is the effect of one component of a sugar molecule on the metabolism that happens in the liver, not else. So sugar, when we're talking about sugar, we're talking about a molecule of glucose, two carbohydrates, glucose bonded to a molecule of fructose. Mm -hmm. Glucose is the stuff of starches and grains and everything, you know, plant-based that we eat. Fructose is the sweetest of the carbohydrates. It's what makes sugar sweet. It's what makes fruit sweet. It's what makes white bread sweet, ironically, because there's a high sugar content in white bread. Um, and it's metabolized, <clears throat> well, glucose is metabolized by virtually every cell in our body. Fructose is metabolized primarily in the liver. And so this chain of causality that I'm discussing in this book, which is well worked out by scientists, but has just kind of been ignored in large part because of, well, it, we could talk about why it's been ignored, but the, uh, and we will. Yes, um, we will. Yeah, the metabolism of the fructose in the liver seems to cause fat accumulation in the liver. The fat accumulation in the liver seems to be a primary cause of a condition called insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. the insulin is secreted by the pancreas, but the resistance starts to happen in the liver. And as you get insulin resistant, your pancreas has to pump out more insulin to do the job that it used to do. And now that insulin makes you uh, burn carbohydrates and store fat and you start getting fatter and then you start getting diabetic and all these chronic diseases follow. So the argument ultimately that what I'm the case I'm arguing is that you add sugar to any population's diet in any amount, and particularly perhaps liquid sugars like Coca-Cola has tried its very best to do around the world and succeeded, then you end up with obesity and diabetes and all the rest. That that's that's great. And and just to add on to that, you uh, make the case in uh, the case against sugar that not only is it diabetes and obesity, but we can even extend the story to um, cancer and to Alzheimer's. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, in the case of both cancer and Alzheimer's, it turns out that there's a pretty profound link with this condition, insulin resistance, and with uptake of glucose, blood sugar for fuel. So when you have elevated blood sugar. Uh, you have a higher risk of dementia, both Alzheimer's and diabetes-related or stroke-related dementia. And insulin itself plays significant roles in both these disease states. So you can find in the medical literature plenty of articles saying that insulin resistance is a driver of both dementia and cancer. And all I'm doing is linking it back to what's the cause of insulin that ultimate insulin resistance. And again, the conventional wisdom is that people just eat too much or they don't exercise enough. The alternative wisdom um, is that um, they, uh, they're they consuming too much sugar. And then, like, well, there are several ways I try to judge how far this message has disseminated into the medical establishment. Yeah. So when I started my research 20 years ago, I would say maybe a dozen physicians in Canada 
and the United States thought like I came to think by the time I was done with my research. For instance, uh -huh. there's a Facebook group in Canada of women physicians who mm -hmm. sort of think and eat like I do. And there, last time I looked, about six months ago, there were maybe four or 4,500 women physicians just in Canada. Um, yeah. So in that case, it's definitely making inroads. And it's around the country, there are people who are pretty well accepted and well respected in the medical research community who think as we do. Um, I think in general, the medical community has accepted that they should have been going after sugar for 50, 60 years at least, and that it's better late than never, and they've all kind of jumped on a sugar bandwagon. Um, the idea that it's the problem is hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance and that sugar can be a cause is something that's still very much a minority viewpoint. You have in, a, in your writing a, a term that I really um, found um, really useful, which was this concept of the sugar latency period. That part of the reason why we don't make, we don't connect these dots between uh, the problem with uh, high sugar and the long, long, long-term consequences of even something like Alzheimer's is that it can take up to 10 to 20 years to actually manifest the illness. And that length of time, we just don't make those connections. It's interesting because the, we're set up, the research community is set up to study a few acute effects of yeah. whatever we put in our mouth. So if something's poisonous, <clears throat> you know, you do a study in the rats or humans and you look what happens over the course of three months. And if somebody eats it and turns green and drops dead, you know that maybe the FDA shouldn't, uh, you know, give it its blessing. Uh -huh. uh, we have no mechanism to test for chronic disease relationships, the relationship. And even um, a point, uh, the great historian Sidney Mintz, who wrote one of two sort of seminal books, on sugar and its history, sweetness and power, a point he made was that sugar does seem to act like a drug, at least when you give it to children. Uh -huh. um, and yet we don't treat it the way we treat other drugs because it doesn't have this sort of acute after effects. Or again, we could debate whether or not it does or not in children, but uh -huh. you don't have a hangover the next day. You don't pass out and you know, after you've had three ice cream cones and crash your car, all these things. So because its effects are delayed, we don't treat it like a drug. And then when the industry has, there's never been any studies that could actually link sugar consumption directly to the diseases it's likely to cause. But there are people who say that uh, you can eat uh, like a vegan lifestyle, which is a fairly high carb plant-based mm -hmm. lifestyle, and they're losing weight and they're doing very well. And, and just yeah. how, how would you fit in this insulin model in that context? Well, so it's interesting because, and then it's part of the reason, the argument that led me to write the case against sugar. Yeah. So in the first book, I, Good Calories, Bad Calories, I resuscitated what had been a British hypothesis in the 60s, advocate, you know, uh, promoted by the leading British nutritionists that the primary problem with modern diets is in fact, white flour and sugar. Mm. And you add white flour and sugar to it. And then, you know, often people would say, well, okay, you're blaming it on these refined carbohydrates. What about Southeast Asia? Now we're yeah. back to the China study. These exactly. people eat a lot of carbs. Yeah. But the carbs they were eating were very different than the carbs we've been eating. So you, you have sort of two different paradigms. One says is as populations become westernized, they eat more. Uh -huh. They eat more fat. They eat more meat. They exercise less. They eat fewer vegetables and fruits. And so the causes of the chronic disease that associate with being westernized are all these eating more, exercising less, eating more meat. Right. And if you remove the meat, you'll get healthier. Okay. And the other paradigm, the one that I was pushing in my book says, yeah. um, promoting is a very viable hypothesis is that as populations get westernized, they add these highly refined carbohydrates to their diets, particularly white flour and sugar. So even populations like the Inuit or yes. the Thai in Africa that were almost exclusively carnivores, when they start eating white flour and sugar get the same diseases that the Southeast Asians get when they start eating mm -hmm. refined flour and sugar. And so um, 
implication is for a diet to be healthy, you have to get rid, which we agree with, you have to get rid of the sugar first. Right. And the flour, so processed grain second. So the white bread. And when you read, when I read the vegan literature and I talk to my vegan friends and my wife is a mostly vegetarian and her sister is a pretty close to being a vegan. It's yeah. you differentiate between a healthy vegan diet and an unhealthy vegan diet. And that's the common ground. The common ground is if you remove the sugar and the white flour, you have a healthy carnivore diet, a healthy keto diet, a healthy paleo diet, a healthy vegan diet, and right. anyone will get healthier uh -huh. eating that than what they were eating. Yeah. And then the question becomes for the vegan world, are they healthier because they're not eating meat? Uh -huh. Are they healthier because they're not eating and drinking sugar and beer and alcohol and right. eating white bread and going to the market and buying Twinkies? In my new books, I have a new book coming out in December called The Case for Keto that addresses, yes. tries to address all these issues. Um, and I have one chapter towards it. I interviewed over 120 physicians for this book among these several tens of thousands that I estimate are now out there. Mm -hmm. And I, it was wonderful because a lot of them are very, very smart. And a lot of them are Canadian because mm -hmm. Canada is sort of leading the way in this shift. There's one uh, chapter in which I uh, discuss two physicians. One is a, a um, uh, spine surgeon Cleveland in Ohio who used to work for the Cleveland Clinic who's a vegan mm. and she eats a vegan ketogenic diet and one is a psychotherapist in western Massachusetts who's a carnivore and eats a carnivore ketogenic diet. Oh that's and great. Both, I, love, I love how we're mixing this so that it's yeah. not one or the other. Right and they both move to vegan versus carnivore. The, the, the doctor who's a vegan says she just can't tolerate animal products she tries on occasions but she can't her body tells her that she's not healthy when she eats them and the one who moved towards carnivore slowly learned that she can't her body can't tolerate plant products yeah. but they both try to keep their insulin as low as possible which is sort of what you're trying to do with the ketogenic diet yeah and the chapter heading is something the spine surgeon told me she said it's not a religion it's just about how i feel Part of what I'm trying to get across in my books is that once we get rid of the, the uh, what to me are the obvious problems of sugar and the refined, highly refined grains, then it becomes about how you feel and what results you're getting. And some of us end up moving further and further towards sort of ketogenic diet and animal rich, animal yeah. product rich diets, because that's what we have to do to feel healthy. Yeah. And some of us end up moving the other way because that's what they have to do to feel healthy. Given that there is the scenario of sugar being a problem that we can agree, regardless of what food plan we're doing, that this is refined, refined flour, refined carbs mm -hmm. and sugar is the problem. Why is it that people are eating this way despite their best intent? So what's your answer to that? It's interesting. The, uh, so, you know, in the book, when you actually, Okay, circa 2000 and say 14, when I was writing that chapter, when you actually go looking for research uh -huh. <clears throat> on sugar and addiction, there was surprisingly little. Mm -hmm. um, in part because the government wouldn't fund it, in part because until maybe the early 2000s, to study such a thing was perceived as quackery. So, you know, the idea was sugar tastes good, we like it, the calorie is a calorie, that's all you need to know, and then don't eat fat because that'll give you heart disease. Um, uh -huh. And that's pretty much what the government's funded. So there were a few groups around the world that studied sugar and addiction in animals and concluded that at least in you know, rats and lab mice, sugar's at least as addictive as morphine or heroin or any other addictive drug. I know from my own experience, and I say in the book, it's impossible to write about these subjects without it being, um, uh, you know, without your own experience. Um, and as I do have a caffeine addiction, I'm always drinking coffee, as, even mm -hmm. in the middle of the afternoon. And um, I had, I was smoked cigarettes in my youth. So I struggle with struggled with all of this and from my own perspective clearly it's addictive 
in a way similar to that of other drugs, but not identical to. And I've met people who would tell me that for them it's identical. So they, by that, for instance, I mean, if I quit sugar after a few days, I don't think about it. I don't have withdrawal symptoms. I don't, but I have to, I can't have it in the house. If I have it in the house, I'm going to eat it. Or I'm going to mm -hmm. think about eating it. Um, other, I've met people who said they had terrible withdrawal getting off sugar, and I'm sure you know. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that your concept, this is one of the reasons why I like it so much, about the, uh, uh, the, the latency period. We can see that with uh, addiction as well, that there is a latency period. Because we eat food and it takes a while to digest, it's not a quick uh, phenomena. Uh, things just take longer, and so that the actual syndrome of addiction takes longer to get um, entrenched into the person's brain. But um, also, there yeah. are other, I mean, it's fascinating, it's a fascinating subject because it's really never been studied. And the ethics of studying it in children is going to be very interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, one of my favorite memories in a sort of perverse sense from my children's childhood was uh, my youngest son when he was, Three after his first Halloween, which is not surprisingly my least favorite holiday of the year. <laughs> right. We let him have like three little candy bars. And you don't think about it. So a three-year-old who made my weight say 30 or 40 pounds, three little candy bars to him would be the equivalent of 20 candy bars to me by weight. Yeah. Okay. Even the little ones. And he took off his clothes and ran around the house naked for 20 minutes. And then when I said, literally like in circles around the house. And when I wow. said, um, you know, okay, you've got to go to sleep now. You have to, he threw himself on the stairs, hysterically sobbing. And we had yeah. to carry him off the bed. And I turned to my wife and I said, if he wouldn't have acted, if we had given him cocaine, his behavior would not have been any more bizarre. Uh -huh. But you don't right. do studies like that on children. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'll tell you, there's one other thing I left out of my book. So mm -hmm. the idea that sugar causes attention deficit hyperactivity. Yes, I want you to disorder. talk about that. Yes. Okay, which, so in the 80s, it would have been called hyperactivity. Yep. And as a parent, I would swear it's true. Okay. Uh -huh. But one of the interesting things is um, in the 80s, they did a series of pretty well-designed studies to test this hypothesis, they being the researchers. And what they did for the most part is they would take kids in school and they would feed them either a sugary beverage or a uh, non-caloric sweetener beverage. Like one, one group would get Coke and one group would get Diet Coke and they wouldn't know what it was. And uh -huh. then they would send them home to their parents and their parents would chart their behavior like did they have a meltdown where they did they lose their temper and then they would compare they could unblind the study so the parents were blinded to what the kids had drank and the kids were blinded to what they drank and then they could chart their behavior afterwards and send them home and see was there any difference and there were about six maybe eight of these studies and there was no difference which is comp pretty compelling, except you could then say, well, wait, maybe we're too far along on this train of mm. sugar consumption. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should do this study by getting the kids off sugar first, spend a month, get them all off sugar, and now do the study and see if you get the same result, and you yeah. might not. And so yeah. there's a lot of issues. Whenever I would say, and I still do this with my kids, they're 15 and 11, and my oldest son gets headaches, and I go, ah, did you have a, you know, juice today? He's like, no, dad, today was not a juice day. He's so tired of this. Yeah. And even my wife points out that I'll pay attention to the times he did and build my theories on that, but I won't pay attention to the times he gets a headache and didn't have any sugar in the past 24 hours. Yeah. Or do I think artificial sweeteners are better than sugar? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes, I do. And I think I know enough people who would never get off sugar if they couldn't use artificial sweeteners as a crutch. Right. I couldn't get off cigarettes without nicotine patches and nicotine right. gum. And then I chewed nicotine gum for a dozen years before I finally quit that. So yeah. Sugar versus artificial sweeteners. I much prefer artificial sweeteners. If nothing else, they're so potent, the sweeteners, that the dose you get is could mm -hmm. be one three hundredth the dose of the sugar. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to imagine as the same kind of cause being 
Um, and the diseases I'm concerned about, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, those, I can't link those to artificial sweeteners the way you can link them to sugar as a strong association. Okay. Um, then the question is, are artificial sweeteners better than... Nothing. <laughs> nothing. And the answer is no. I mean, if right. you could, I think everyone is better than get rid of their sweet tooth. Yeah. Okay. And that's uh, the so goal. So um, now I want to ask about the sugar industry. So here you are um, uh, uh, speaking against the sugar industry. Have you had any uh, retaliation? I've just been very curious about this. What's their um, response to you? Uh, no, and I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> what am I, chopped industry. liver? Have you had any uh, retaliation? I've just been very curious about this. What's um, their response to you? Uh, no, and I'm disappointed. <laughs> what am I, chopped liver? It's come on. Um, <laughs> the uh, even uh, four or five years ago, Rob Lustig, who is the sort of primary yeah. physician and researcher in the medical community, has been taking up this anti-sugar uh, movement. Yeah. Uh, and Rob showed me a list of people the sugar industry had identified as. Um, as sort of an enemy's list, and I wasn't on it, and I was, <laughs> was hurt. But the, um, no, actually, um, you know, they've been, part of the message of the last 60 years is they're very good at public relations, the sugar industry and the corn refining. Sorry, when I was writing, so my sugar book started off with the research, good calories, bad calories, and I did a cover story for the New York Times Magazine in 2011 called Is Sugar Toxic? Mm -hmm. And I was interviewing um, everyone I could interview, and I, one of the people I got to was the head of the Corn Refiners Association. Mm. So these are the associate people who put out high fructose corn syrup. Yes, yes. And she said to me in the interview, are you, you know, writing uh, positive, I mean, in what take are you you know, taking in this article. And I said, well, I'm writing about those researchers who are asking the question of whether there's something unique about sugar and, and, and caloric sweeteners that causes these metabolic changes and these diseases like, um, you know, obesity, diabetes, whether they're uniquely toxic. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, what side do you come down on? Mm. And I don't, I'm just, not going to lie about this. I said, you know, frankly, I, they make a compelling case to me and that's the case I'm going to make. And she was fine with that. The only thing she was concerned about was that I not portray high fructose corn syrup as different than sugar ah. because they had such confidence that sugar would succeed, <laughs> that people would not give up their drug in effect, Yeah. that all they wanted to do is be carried along is you know, recognize right. that they're not worse than sugar. And Boy, the sugar industry itself, yeah, they never directly went after people. Uh -huh. And I, I don't really blame them because it's, it's a lot of times people say the sugar industry is no worse, than, is as bad as the tobacco industry. But the, what the tobacco industry had to do was convince the world that what the researchers knew about tobacco was not true. Mm -hmm. Whereas what the sugar industry had to do was convince the world was that what the researchers believed, you know, a calorie is a calorie, yeah. and fat is a problem, was true. Uh -huh. So they funded people in the nutrition community to better get across their message that what they believed was true was yeah. indeed true and true for sugar also. Yeah. And considering this very small percentage of people believed otherwise, you could ask the question, what was their obligation to believe the fringe people, you know, versions of me 60 yes. years ago. Yes. And, you know, there's fringe people who are always arguing crazy things. Um, <laughs> with the vegan movement, which is the chipsy argument from is it sugar and refined grains to is it meat and animal products? And, <laughs> You know, I, I mean, if they're right, then they're certainly right to do it. But because I don't believe they are, it's sort of it confounds the issue of getting people healthy. I don't want somebody saying, hey, you know, Coca-Cola is vegan. If I don't eat my hamburger, but I drink my Coke and eat my French fries, I'll be healthy. And well, this is you know, one of the advantages to being a journalist. And by the way, yeah. when it comes to sugar industry, 
uh, influence on the science. Um, you know, Kristen Kearns gets the bulk of the credit for that, and I can't leave her out. She came to me uh, 10 years ago, well, eight years ago, with, you know, the research she had gathered herself uh -huh. as a dentist who was concerned about what she was seeing and did remarkable work and gets, you know, I, I just got to benefit from her uh, investigative research. But for the bigger story, uh -huh. as a journalist, um, you know, when people don't realize, so I'm a journalist with a science background, and my first two books were on bad science. So I'm, yeah. I, it's what I know as well as anyone. People don't get degrees studying bad science. I actually had the opportunity to write two books on researchers who got the wrong answers. So I, I huh. know what it smells like. Uh -huh. you know, I know what, and then as a journalist, you can interview anyone. So as part of an academic's job, you're not calling up your colleagues and exactly. interviewing them on the phone about what they think. I could do that. And I could do it with hundreds. I think I interviewed 600 researchers, administrators for yeah. my first book. I'm always a, a kind of embarrassed when I find somebody who played a significant role who I didn't talk to. Huh. Um, and I could call up people. I you know, who had done their work 40, 50 years earlier, who were wow. in their 80s and 90s, yeah. and talked to them, you know, about how they interpreted the work and what, and people will be very honest with you about the problems when they're not writing for a American Medical Association yeah. journal or their reviewers. Yeah. So in one sense, journalists aren't, we're not trained to do what we do, but we have an enormous benefit in getting to talk to, and then as you put it, we're not locked into a discipline. Yeah. So also, you spent four years. That's like a PhD amount of material that on, on an area that we spend, I don't know, a few hours. Well, not only that, it's, um, I did it at the period when the internet really was like a new technology that had come along uh -huh. and it allowed me to do what would have been 30 or 40 years of work previously. You know, it used to be you had to go to the library and you'd sit in the library and you'd laboriously pull out a book. And, and now, I mean, it's funny, today you can download them all. Now it's too much information. But when I did it, it was just enough that I could, it was doable. And I had young researchers in Boston, New York, and Los Angeles, whose job was to go to medical school libraries. And I would send them emails with mm. 50 references. Mm. And they would go to the libraries. I couldn't get into the medical school libraries in New York because you needed right. proper ID. Yeah. And they would get them for me and they would just, I would get boxes in the mail of, wow. you know, hundreds yeah. and hundreds of, uh, and you could buy any book on the subject, which included uh, conference proceedings. So you could, I could chart the history of obesity and diabetes research by the textbooks, which I could buy used and, it, you know, for, eight dollars from a bookstore in Ohio, which would be happy to mail it to me. And then from the conference proceedings that yeah. nobody wanted 50 year old conference proceedings except right. me. So yeah, it was really, um, it was quite an experience. The problem is it locked me into being this sort of nutrition zealot that huh. I now have to live for the rest of my uh -huh. life. Yeah, but, but, but we love you. We love the zealotry we love, because we're zealots. <laughs> Um, uh, so in speaking in the spirit of zealotry, I'm going to end, end my questions with one more question, which is, um, what can we do in terms of uh, uh, confronting big sugar? What, what do you think is the next thing um, either that you can do or that we can do in terms of moving the agenda of zealotry towards um, big sugar? Well, I think what we want to do, and I think we're succeeding at this, is convincing people that sugar is not benign. Mm -hmm. that sugary beverages are not benign, that it's not about the calories, you can't balance it out, that if you want to be healthy, this is a food product you have to avoid. And the more, the better job you do at avoiding it, the more healthy you'll feel and you know, the, the more positive feedback you'll get. Yeah, so, so what we've done is actually have lined up uh, three people, Adrian. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for this. Um, as an executive chef, it it, it kills me when I see how much sugar is in our uh, food supply. And, uh, you know, I see it in my daughter's school system and it, it just doesn't make sense to me. And to try and push that narrative to what we need to do in terms of getting sugar out. Um, you know, it's 
it's two questions. One is what would you suggest would be the best route to get this message across to the schools? Parents together and approach the school board and see, you know, whether they're open to that kind of, uh, the problem also is they make money from selling sugary beverages and vending machines. So you have to deal with that as well. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vera Tarman and Gary Tobes. What a delight to be here with both of you. <clears throat> My question has to do with uh, what do you suggest for families and especially parents of children impacted by sugar consumption? What can a parent do? What can the teacher do? Our school system, I think they're impacted. I put a note there about the political uh, national agenda in terms of food for schools. Um, but what can a doctor or a dentist do? Because all of these people have an impact, drip, 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 uh, to make a change. So what can we say and do for our children, and especially children that um, don't have epilepsy? So can we do some things that move toward keto and keep them healthy and all of that? Where's What can we do? Okay, so this is very clearly child dependent. And my, you know, I have to acknowledge that I've been I'm a parent. I say that in my book, that even everything I write in the book is also informed by the fact that I have two boys and it's a constant struggle to keep the house. And I can tell you what I do, which is um, we're not a family that's predisposed to obesity or diabetes. So it's a different issue. It doesn't run in our families. Um, I'm about as thick and as heavy as any of my relatives are. Um, and uh, so I try to keep the house juice and soda free. And it's still a struggle because my wife thinks children should get to enjoy childhood. I don't know where she gets that idea. And that includes sugar to some extent. Um, they know they won't get dessert from me although they know they can get it occasionally from their mother. And, um, you know, I think we have an obligation to, to teach our kids to eat healthy and whatever that means. And I've actually fought about that with my, my family, which is, look, this is, you know, part of what being a parent means is teaching our kids to eat healthy and trying to make it happen. And eating healthy at the moment you know, means keeping sugar consumption to a minimum. And that's basically what I try to do. I don't fight. Um, I think if doctors and dentists reinforce it, if your physician says or your dentist says, don't do this, and they've always been hesitant to do it, and the message right is fat and salt, not sugar. But if the physicians and the dentists are saying to the children, you know, you really shouldn't do this. This is bad for you. I think the message is far more powerful than if it comes from the parents, or at least my kids will listen to their doctor more than they'll listen to me. There's a fellow in the uh, chat who just said that he's written a book called Sugar Proof, which is all about how to empower families. To yes, my sugar. So if, if somebody wants to look on the chat, did you want to add something to that, Gary? I was just going to say it's Michael Goran from yeah. uh, I can... USA. Hi, Michael, if you're there. Are you did there? You, yeah. I, I can unmute him. Would you like that? Yeah, I think you should have okay. Michael on your... Okay, Michael, give me uh, two seconds here. You should be unmuted now. Hi, this is a great, great conversation. Thank you. This has been wonderful. So tell us about, tell, tell, tell the audience about Sugar Proof, which just came out about a month ago. Huh. Yeah, sh Sugar Proof. Uh, I've, I've been uh, doing research at USC and Children's Hospital on sugars in children and We've, 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 just, we've just published this book with Penguin Random House, and it's basically a plan to do what you were just talking about, to help families wow. uh, raise kids who can learn how to self-regulate in sugar. So we're not saying we can take it away, because as Gary says, in many cases, sugar is sweet treats as part of childhood. So the idea is to try and cut out the usual culprits, find all the hidden sugars in the house so that we can enjoy, uh, have kids enjoy sweet treats. And we have recipes in there that all, none of them use added sugar. So we've, we've developed recipes that use natural sweetness of whole foods, like bananas or dates or apples for, for the sweetness. Um, and we have a seven day plan 
for, for getting families through a period of no added sugars, just to see what happens if you take sugars out of the diet. Okay. Hi, Gary. Thanks for taking my question. Hey, Sherry. Um, you were talking earlier about behavioral problems in kids and how they may or may not relate to sugar in the diet. Um, and you also talked about mom, a pregnant mom's diet and the effect that can have on the eventual obesity and diabetes outcomes of her child. And I'm just wondering if there's any known link at all between the diet of a pregnant mom and behavioral outcomes in the kids. Well, I'm going to ask Michael Goran to answer this because we discussed this just yesterday. And there's a study he knows about that I, it was new to me. So, Michael, can you click on? Yeah, you're on again. <laughs> yeah, so it's both, both real sugar and alternative sweeteners studies show that consumption during pregnancy can a amplify uh, preference for sweetness so babies are born with a natural preference for sweetness because it's supposed to be protective but that can be amplified by exposure in, in, in the womb to either real sugar or alternative sweeteners and also both real sugar and alternative sweeteners can induce higher risk for obesity in the offspring that can be manifested as young as one year of age. So for some reason, we don't know the mechanism, but even alternative sweeteners can be obesogenic mm. and, and promote greater preference for sweetness. Yes. Hi, Gary, I love your books. Thank and you. I was wondering what you think about CGMs. I've had clients use CGMs with great success at just self-monitoring and regulating and, and really reversing their diabetes. So I'm wondering what you think about them and for people um, with metabolic syndrome. I got a <laughs> prescription the other day. Whoops, there we go. Oh, why not? I don't know what it is, Backwards. CGM, what is it? It's a, it's a continuous glucose monitor. Oh. And so it's a... Wow. Relatively new invention. They're about a decade old, and you stick them on. They're the size of a maybe a dollar coin, and there's one. And you can monitor your blood sugar all day long, 24/7, and and read it off on your smartphone. And it's of course developed for diabetics. I got it because I was I'm writing a book about diabetes, and I was curious about my blood sugar. Um, it's you there we go it's used by not just people who suffer from diabetes but the it's being embraced on some level by the low carbohydrate crowd because the idea ultimately is you're trying to keep your blood sugar as stable as possible and your insulin use as low as possible um i've been told that it's a very powerful behavioral tool that mm. you give a continuous glucose monitor someone with diabetes and they suddenly see what meal to meal what the foods are doing to their blood sugar it doesn't measure the insulin though eh? no it just measures blood sugar it's a shame it doesn't measure insulin because you could get a by hyper secreting insulin you could get a yeah. blunted blood sugar response but um i think it's it's probably the technology that will change our dietary thinking more than any other Mm. Um, because it, it suddenly direct by once you direct attention to blood sugar, which is sort of the message of all the sugar carb story, then now you have a way to see how it directly influences. And they're rel relatively inexpensive, even without um, insurance. I think it's like seventy dollars in the United States for oh. two weeks to test your blood sugar and see what's happening and maybe why figure out why it's happening. So. Gary, is there anything you wanted to uh, close off with, some sort of message of hope or, or um, something that you'd like to leave us with to think about? Um, sugar consumption in the United States, where I know the numbers peaked in 1999, pretty much as soon as we knew there was an obesity epidemic, sugar consumption started coming down and has been coming down pretty steadily since mm -hmm. then. So you, this message is getting out there. And this is the easy message. The health community, your physicians are very happy to get people off sugar. So we're definitely making progress. We're getting the message across. And I think, you know, again, whether it will be enough to reverse the damage that's been done over the past century, I'm less optimistic about that. But 
you know, we're getting there. And we're at a place today, 20 years ago, to talk like we've been talking about sugar was quackery. Yeah. Now it's, you know, yeah, everyone thinks that way. And 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 it's and it, a lot of it is thanks to you uh, and and the work that you've done. So I, I would like to say, uh, Gary, thank you for your generosity of time today with us and talking about your um, your knowledge base, your books, why we get fat, good calories, bad calories, and especially the case against sugar. We are fans. We love the work that you do. You've made the discussion of sugar toxicity commonplace today and uh, a potential rally point um, against big sugar. Because really, the more we know what you're saying, the more, the, the more changes happen. And actually, the angrier we're getting and the more uh, we're willing to uh, stop eating the, the demon sugar. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Vera. All right. Thank you, Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. <laughs>